Let's pray, friends. Our Father in heaven, we've heard your call. In your Son, Jesus Christ, you became like us so that we might know you and know your love and even see you dying for us and see the power of your love in the resurrection of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Our Father in heaven, we hear your call. We hear your call to love you and to love our neighbors just as Jesus has done. And this is a wonderful call, Lord. This is a call of joy. This is a call to happiness. And we trust in you, Lord. And so today and every day, Lord, we celebrate that. We bring you praises. We celebrate what you've done in Jesus Christ. We worship you. Our Father in heaven, please bless us now in this time of worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's rise together and worship God. This is our final class this semester, and I hope you... Uh, feel and see that we have treated most of the major uh, jurisprudential passages, is the way I would put it in the the scripture, uh, passages which provide a a general basis for looking at the law as as a whole. I hope you have a feel of the the progression by which we've, we've dealt with this, going from the most broad questions, does our faith in Jesus Christ uh, have anything to tell us about the world? to a very specific question that we'll end with, which is uh, actually often put forward as a Christian claim that uh, although uh, when Christ came, as we saw, he came to to reveal uh, not some side truth, not some partial truth, not a truth for here or there, but the truth about everything. Jesus Christ is the the, uh, image uh, of God himself, and it was through him that everything was made that was made. And not just through him in the sense of an instrument, but for him, and that currently everything holds together in him. Uh, To misunderstand Jesus is to misunderstand everything, and to understand Jesus is to understand everything. That's where we began the the semester. But uh, we're going to deal today with a passage that many people put forward as an argument that we should retreat from a critical aspect of life, a retreat from the area of law and and politics uh, because God has uh, not uh, put his uh, stamp, not put his command, uh, that Christ is somehow unrelated to this area of of life. And that's this very uh, famous passage from Matthew 22. I've summarized it there at the beginning. Uh, We're going to return to it several times. But people often uh, quote it like this. They'll, they'll say, uh, wasn't Jesus asked about taxation? And this is true. The Pharisees and the Herodians uh, were sent to Jesus to trap him. And uh, they said, tell us, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? And then people will, will say this to you. They'll say, uh, and Jesus answered, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. And that's true. Jesus did say that. Of course, he goes on a little bit. And they, they offer this claim as uh, showing, they offer this, uh, this text as showing that uh, what God did is gave some things to Caesar and uh, some things to himself. And as long as we're dealing with the things of, of Caesar, and Caesar here is, of course, the, the name uh, that was given to the emperor of the, of the Roman Empire, uh, following from Julius Caesar, uh, this was the name that the supreme uh, autocrat of the Roman Empire took, the supreme leader of the Roman Empire took. And so it's taken to be a, a symbol. God has given some things into the control of uh, powerful government people like Caesar, and so you should leave it with, with them. This is a really uh, strange idea. I mean, if you've read nothing other than the Bible than this one passage you might think that that was a sensible interpretation of the passage, that that Christ here creates a separation between issues like taxation, which are uh, uncontrolled by the word of God, that that there's no biblical norm that relates to issues like taxation, because the only thing we should do is focus on what Caesar has to say, because these things are, are given to him. And I've heard this uh, all of my life. In fact, the, the, undoubtedly, the first political 
uh, theology or legal uh, theology I ever heard was the quotation of this passage. If somebody would bring up a matter of the Bible in the context of polit politics, they would say, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Well, I, I want to uh, attack this uh, misinterpretation. If you want a fuller treatment of this, just go back to the first question in our materials that deals with whether or not uh, what it, God has revealed to us in Jesus Christ uh, has a universal meaning on all subjects. Uh, that was the first question we treated this, this semester. If you want more of this, just go back to that because that rebuts this interpretation. But there's more specific ways of rebutting it. And that's uh, how we're going to go uh, today before we reach our conclusion for the semester. So uh, the, the people who say, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, meaning there is a, a zone, there is a, a, an area of life, a kingdom that is ruled by man that's separate from the, the kingdom of God. Uh, they, they say, well, this is uh, the paradigmatic example, taxation. This question was asked in the, in the area of taxes. Should we pay taxes to Caesar? And so uh, this is the paradigmatic example. Taxation is something that is uh, just controlled by the ideas and purposes and will of man. And whatever man finds fitting to do in this area, it's right to do. Well, this is, uh, in biblical terms, this is nonsense. Taxation is a, an issue which is supremely important in, uh, to God. It's uh, an area that God identifies. There can be justice or injustice. There can be either fidelity to him or infidelity. And if you are unjust and wrongful in the way you tax, you need to repent to God, not to Caesar. You need to repent to God. You, you, you can violate God's will in relationship to taxation and uh, people who, who are abusive in taxation are actually a, a figure, a, a, a common repeated trope, an idea in scripture of people who are wrongdoers. So let's look at, at some of these passages. First off on, on the, the list, when God is pleading with the people of Israel not to give up their right faith in him and instead to put their, their faith in a king wrongfully, in 1 Samuel 8, which we've already looked at this, this semester. The basic way that God tries to communicate the bad things that the king will do to him is he will engage in unjust taxation. He will engage in unjust taxation of many kinds. The, the first thing he says, talks about is war. The kings will take your young men to make war, okay? But, but then he goes on and he talks about taxes. He will take the best of your fields, and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage, the, the grapes that you produce, and give it to his officials and attendants. Your men servants and maid servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys he will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his slaves. Uh, what's described here is a, a system of taxation of the king taking for public use to support the, the government, the king and his attendants, ever more and more and more of what would otherwise be your, your personal property and using it for public purposes. And this is not uh, supposed to be good. Uh, God says, when the day comes, you'll cry out for relief from the king. And because of your unfaithfulness, I won't answer you. Because you chose this king over me, when you finally come to your senses and cry out for relief from oppressive taxation, I won't answer you. This is your punishment. Uh, in, this, in this figure, oppressive taxation is the natural punishment that comes when people give up good governance through faith in God for idolatrous government through faith in a king. Now, you, you, you might think, well, maybe there's something going on here. There's, there's just no, there's no moral consequence. Taxes are some kind of curse on man for unfaithfulness, but there, there's no moral issue in the one who imposes such taxation. Well, look at Matthew 9.11 here on page 82. 
When the Pharisees saw this, they asked Jesus' disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And one thing that Jesus could have done is he could have said, well, tax collectors belong to the realm of Caesar. What are you talking about? There's no, there's no uh, sin in tax collecting because we just give to Caesar what is Caesar's. This is outside the, the scope and control of my mission on earth. Handling oppressive and unfair taxation, that doesn't have anything to do with the kingdom of God. That's given to Caesar, right? This is the interpretation that's offered. Give to Caesar the tax issues and presumably a bunch of other issues, but tax is critical here because that's the example that Jesus is asked to comment on. But Jesus doesn't answer this by saying, tax collectors, that doesn't have anything to do with me. He says, they're sick. I go to them because healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. You want to know why I am with taxpayers and other sinners? It's because they need me, Jesus says. It would make no sense if Jesus believed that taxation was not an issue that pertained to him. It would make no sense if Jesus thought that taxation was not an issue that pertained to his Father in heaven, that his Father in heaven didn't care about. It would make no sense for him to doctor those who engage in wrongful taxation unless this was a form of sin to which Jesus Christ was the cure. Again, uh, Luke uh, 3.12. This is with John the Baptist. Tax collectors also came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked him, what should we do? Now, the right answer, if tax issues are given to Caesar, is you should do what Caesar tells you to do. Because tax issues have nothing to do with the kingdom of God. Tax, that and, that and the kingdom of God are totally separate. Divine law, justice, norms, repentance, being washed because you've done something wrong in taxation, that doesn't have anything to do with us. Go to Caesar and ask his forgiveness. If you've wronged Caesar, then give back to Caesar. But why do you come and ask for cleansing? Why do you ask for repentance? Why do you ask for guidance with respect to taxation issues since it has nothing to do with the kingdom of God, with the proclamation of the coming of Christ, with the repentance of sins? Well, that's not what he says. In fact, he tells them what, what's appropriate for them to do in this context. Don't collect any more than you're required to. With, with, with what voice does he speak? Was this a man in imperial robes? Was this a, a centurion? No, this was a prophet of God. This is a prophet of God talking about tax. Why? Because the Bible is always concerned about tax. The law of God has tax laws in it. Oppressive taxation is a fundamental issue, a part of the fundamental curse by which man is, is condemned in, in 1 Samuel 8. Uh, Jesus clearly associates abusive taxation with sin in need of, of doctoring. It goes on, next page, Matthew 21, 31. Jesus said to, you, uh, to them, I tell you the truth. The tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him, but tax collectors and prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. Jesus talks to those who are not turning to him as Savior. He talks to those before whom the signs of the kingdom of God are being shown. And what is a sign of the kingdom of God which condemns these people, which brings them into judgment? What is a sign of, of judgment that these people have witnessed that should make it clear to them who he is? He's seen, they have seen tax collectors repent. We were just reading about that. Tax collectors are repenting. Prostitutes are, are repenting. People who are in sin are repenting. And again, look. If, if tax has nothing to do with, with God, if you can take the world of tax and, and push it outside and say that belongs to Caesar, then, then how can Jesus say this? How can he say, I, I tell you, 
that tax collectors who repent of their sins are coming into the kingdom of God before you, you should have, John came to prepare you for my coming. He came to show you the way. And what you saw was tax collectors repenting. What they should have said is, tax collectors, tax collectors, tax collectors don't have anything to do with the kingdom of God. Because give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Well, of, of course, we have the testimony of Christ that that's not true. Very famous story about this. I mean, it's so reverse of what the Bible actually teaches us about taxation issues that not only do we have general, uh, general uh, assertion that the repentance of tax collectors is a sign to the people of the coming of God, but also we have a very famous personal story about the repentance of a tax collector. Luke uh, 19. This is the story of Zacchaeus. Jesus is walking along. He looks up, sees uh, Zacchaeus in a tree, so eager, so eager to find a way to, to cleanse the, the sins of his soul that he's climbed up a tree to look for Jesus Christ. He's, he's eager to find him so much that he's adopted this humiliating position by climbing up a tree. And Jesus looks at him and says, come down. I have to stay at your house today. And so he came down at once and he welcomed him and all the people saw this and began to mutter and say, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. Now, one thing Jesus could say is, sinner, you can't sin in tax. The only person you can wrong in taxation issues is Caesar because it belongs to Caesar. But he doesn't say that. Zacchaeus stands up and he said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor and if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said, today you have done your duty to Caesar and no doubt Caesar will be pleased with you. For issues of taxation belong to the realm of Caesar. No, Jesus didn't say that. He did not say of the repentance of this tax collector for the wrongs that he'd done in collecting taxes that this only concerns Caesar. He says the opposite. Today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save what was lost. What lie is it to say that issues of taxation and similar things, that when Jesus said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, he meant, they have nothing to do with the kingdom of God. They have nothing to do with salvation, that God doesn't care about what goes on with these things. What kind of horrid lie is that? Not only is that not what the Bible says, but the Bible makes it perfectly plain that issues of taxation are critical to God. That these are issues of sin and righteousness, not just before Caesar, but before God too. But as I mentioned to you last week, the people who push these kind of uh, uh, interpretations are, are not doing so because they care about the entire word of God. They're, they're doing so because they hope to emasculate the church and the witness of the church to the transformation of all of life. They hope to, to cut off the power of the church, which is to know the source of creation, the maintainer of creation, the, the purpose of creation, to know the way that the principle of, of love, divine love, can be embodied in this world, in our lives and in the lives of other people through repentance and turning to Jesus Christ in faith. And they want to say, uh, well, you guys keep that in church, but as soon as you walk out the church doors, that belongs to Caesar, now shut your mouth. Leave Zacchaeus in the tree in the misery of his sins. Leave him in the tree confused about justice. Leave people confused about what is right and wrong with respect to public affairs because that belongs to Caesar. Well, that belongs to the lie. That belongs to the Lord of lies. That belongs to the murderer. It's not true. It's not what the Bible says. Jesus, when he, he preaches, oftentimes continues to use the unrepentant tax collector as an example of the, the, the worst kind of sinfulness. Matthew 18 talks about how we should, how we should deal with a sinning brother. 
And it concludes with the necessity for church discipline if a person won't repent. Matthew 18, 17, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan. That is to say, somebody who, who follows idols or a tax collector. Now, for the people who offer this interpretation of give to Caesar what is Caesar's, this should be the hardest passage in the Bible. Because a, a tax collector, what does it mean to treat someone like a tax collector? I get what it would be like to treat someone like a pagan. I guess that's bad. But a tax collector, I guess for the people who say give to Caesar what is Caesar's means there's an area outside the discipline of the church. It means nothing. To treat someone like a tax collector is to treat someone like someone we can't see or can't know in Jesus Christ because his world is Caesar's world, not ours. Why would Jesus use the example? Why would he use it as a model, an example, a paradigm of how we should treat an unrepentant, Caesar, uh, unrepentant sinner, say, treat them like you would a tax collector. But Jesus, I thought, I thought you, you taught that those people were outside of the church's discipline because that belongs to Caesar. Clearly, he doesn't mean that. They're the, the paradigm of people who should be excluded from the church. Uh, give to Caesar cannot mean what I was taught it meant. Maybe you were taught it meant, which is that, that God has picked some issues of civil government, the kinds of things that Caesars typically exercise control over, and uh, he, has, he has separated himself from that and, and given, given uh, no concern, no heed. He has no rules. He has no authority. Uh, that area belongs to Caesar or Satan or whoever you want it to be. Let's look at the, the, the full uh, story now, uh, not just the way it's often read, as if the words end with uh, give to Caesar. Let's look at the full story now. It's actually two versions of the story, if you want to read it on, on your own, one in Matthew and one in, um, in Luke. But we're going to look at the, the version in, in Matthew. There's only one difference that's important in the, in the story, and I've noted it here. There's a slightly different word used for uh, for the tax, but I, I don't think it makes much difference. Here it is. Here's the whole story. Matthew twenty two fifteen. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. And we have, we have an example of the strategy because in Luke 23, we, we hear that they accuse Jesus to the authorities by saying, we found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be Christ a king. So we, we, we have some sense. They, they want him to oppose payment of taxes so they can accuse him and get him in trouble uh, that way. And they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Herod is the Samaritan king, and he uh, likes to play up his Jewish identity, but he has a hard time following uh, the law of God. He, on the one hand, he likes to do a lot for the temple, uh, he likes to associate himself with uh, Jewish rules. Uh, his, the Pharisees are his enemies because the, the Pharisees are annoyed by the ways that he breaks the, the law, marrying his, his brother's sister, which, of course, lost, uh, was the cause of the dispute with John the Baptist, and many other things. But the, the, the forces of evil, so to speak, the Pharisees and the Herodians, can combine to try to trap Jesus here. Teacher, they said, we know you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. And you aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are. They're, they're trying to butter Jesus up. Oh, we're, we're, we're in awe of you. You're so great. You have no fear. Now answer this, this question so we can go accuse you to the authorities. Well, tell us then. What is your opinion? Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now, when we, we go forward, the next sentence is very important because Jesus is answering them not according to their question as if it was naively given, as if it was 
a truthful question. He knows what they're doing. He knows they're, they're, they're doing this, so he's not going to be answering them as if they were a good faith person coming up to him and asking a tax question. If this, these people were confused people coming up to Jesus, then he would have answered them in their ignorance. He would have answered them out of their desire to know. He would have answered them in love. But, but these are people who are answering to try and murder him. They are trying to, to engage him in a way that will set them up to commit judicial murder, to give false testimony against them, which they do carry out. Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said. So this answer is addressed not just to their question, but also to their evil intent. You hypocrites, you actors, is what hypocrite means. Why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. And they brought him a denarius, which is usually said to be about a day's wage. That's the, the usual evaluation. So not nothing, but not the biggest sum of money, but a, a, a weighty amount of money. And he asked them, whose portrait is this? The Greek word there is icon. Whose semblance, whose similarity, whose icon is this? And whose inscription? And if you want to know what they're talking about, if you turn over to page 85, uh, here's the coin that, that was most widely in, in circulation at the, at the time. This is a, a Roman denarius. And you see two features on it. You see uh, Caesar portrayed as a god. And there's, uh, that's the, the, Jesus asks, whose icon, whose image, whose similarity. And then he also says, whose inscription? Inscription is the writing. There's writing on the coin. And it's, it's uh, a little hard to make out, but uh, the, the writing on, on a Tiberian uh, denarius at the, at the time would have, would have said, Tiberius Caesar Augustus the son of God, the son of the divine Augustus. This, the coin contained an explicit claim that the emperor was the son of God. Now, the irony here, of course, abounds. The actual son of God is before them. They're trying to, to kill him. They're trying to trap him. And he asks for a coin, and the coin has a, a picture of a man who is wearing the indicia of divinity. Um, and uh, on the backside of the coin, he is uh, in the position of a god in the temple, and the inscription is Pontifex Maximus, which means the high priest, the high priest. The, the Roman emperor uh, took over the role of the high priest of the, the Roman pagan religions. He would offer uh, the sacrifices. Uh, he, would, he had the honors of being the chief mediator. Uh, Pontifex uh, is the one who makes a bridge between God and man. Pons means a bridge, and Fex means maker. Pontifex is the bridge maker between God and man, and it was their uh, formal term for a priest. So uh, that's, what's, that's what's specifically going on here. Uh, whose image is this? It's the image of Caesar as a god. And what does it say? It says, here is the son of God, our high priest. Yeah, so, the irony should abound, right? The, the irony uh, abounds here. And they reply, Caesar's, which is a, a bit of an understatement. And then he said to them, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. And this, this line is, is, it's an interesting line to read. And I someday sit down with your Bible and open this up and read it uh, in several different ways. So you can read it like this. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's and God what is God's. Or you can read it with a pause. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Now, that's a very interesting, interesting position. This is where most modern readings end. But let the, let the pause be pregnant. Let the, the, the pause be filled with thought. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. This is the most frightening, frightening precept 
that a, a world that is obsessed with justice can hear. This is the, the, the most frightening idea that the world can hear. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's great. He's a man. Sometimes he's there. Sometimes he's there. He's not watching me all the time. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. He's, he's written these laws and that laws. He's taxed this and not that and the other thing. For a, for a man, I can live up to the claim of justice. But if I say to you, give to God what is God's, now what do you do? What is God's? You're, you're, uh, you're familiar with uh, the law of, of man. You're familiar with the ideas of, of property and, and ownership. And many of you may be familiar with the ideas expressed in the Bible that everything is God's. That everything in this creation is God's. He's, he's made it. The Lockean labor theory. He, he poured his labor into it. It belongs to him. You have the word of God saying this. Give to, to Caesar what is Caesar's, okay. But give to God what is God's? Do you do that? Do we do that? Think through just for a second why this, is, this claim, this idea has terrified people. You don't give to God what is God's. Rightly, the world and everything in it that you associate with, you should use for God's glory. You should use according to his, his commands. He, is, he has given it to you. You should be grateful to him. But when you eat, does your heart fill with gratitude? When you breathe, do you breathe in gratitude to God? Do you exhale love? When you drink the water, does the quenching of your thirst lead your, your heart and your mind to God? Everything is God's. In every time you use it and everything you do, you should be giving to God what is God's. If he doesn't want the water, he, he certainly wants you to understand his love for you and to respond to that love for you. There is a, a, a precept of, of Roman law. Uh, there is a, a rule in the, in, the, in the Roman law. All the law is summed up in three precepts. A live virtuously. This is what is permitted. Uh, harm no one. This is what is prohibited. And give to each his due. This is what is commanded. The, the law consists of three modes. Permission, prohibition, and command. Some things we must do, some things we may not do, and some things we are authorized to do. We're, we're told, you may do this. The, the, the normally, the last of these, the command to give what is due is considered kind of the summation of the law. Justice is itself oftentimes summed up to say, justice is just having a perpetual will to give everybody what is theirs. That's, that's what justice is, the Romans said. Well, this makes a lot of sense. But you can see Jesus actually attacking man's complacency with justice in these words. You come and you ask for justice. You're always asking for justice. From other people, you want justice. Maybe in some part of life, you give other people justice. But where does God fit into your calculation? Where does God fit into your understanding of justice? You, you talk about what people owe you, do you talk about what people owe God? This is the, the point that the, the Christians in the early Roman world have made over and over again. This is the, the proper right uh, interpretation and inculcation of this teaching of, of Jesus. Sure, of course, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Give to your parents what is your parents. Paul says in, in Romans 13, give to every man what is due to them. Respect, tax, give, the, give everybody what they're owed. But the critical question is that you give to God what is his. And you can't do that by yourself. You can't. You don't want to, for one thing. You, you lack the strength of will to do it. You lack the strength of, of vision to do it. And Jesus has said to you so tenderly, 
by, by trusting in me and understanding that I've given you all of these things through the cross. I, I've given you a way of reconciling yourself to God and doing all that you need to do to God through repentance, through forgiveness, through responding to that love that God has shown you in love for others. This is your way to give to God what is His due. If it's the other interpretation, if you read this, you say, well, God is, uh, uh, Jesus is saying some things belong to God and some things belong to Caesar, then the next line makes no sense. When they heard this, they were amazed, so they left and went away. What's so amazing about it? If, if what they understood this to mean was some things are given to Caesar and some things are given to God, the way we're told today, well, then they, the next question wouldn't be amazement. They would just go, okay. Well, then, you know, the denarius, which is it? Am I going to give it to God? Am I to pay the tax or not? Is it God's or is it man's? That's what we asked you. They understood something different. These people understood something different than the secularists, than the, the wolves in sheep's clothing that we have in the church today talking about this than the, the dividers and destroyers of the church. There, there is something else going on here. What's amazing to them? What's amazing to them, I think, is, is quite clear, is Jesus has held up an image, an icon. And the Greek word for icon, is, the Greek word for image, icon, which is icon, is the very word that the Bible in Greek uses to describe us being made in the image of God. If I say uh, the coin is marked with the icon of Caesar, so give it to him, and then I say, long pause, and give something else marked with the icon of God to God's, what am I talking about? You are marked with the icon of God. You are marked with the likeness of God. You are made in God's image. You are a coin stamped with God's image. And sin truly has, has rubbed out and obscured that image to a certain degree. And so Jesus comes, as, as we, we read in the scriptures that, that follow, Jesus comes and he desires to remake man in his image again. He calls you to remake yourself in the image of Jesus Christ, which is the perfect resemblance to God, which is the only perfect resemblance we know. You were made in God's image. You are restored to God's image in Jesus Christ. Your, your whole moral destiny is in this relationship between you and God. Not a, a relation of slavishness, of one person being like one thing and another person being like another. Not like a, a, a rider and the horse of, of two different species. You are like God and you are called to be like Him. And you are called to that by the one who is his perfect likeness. And you bear an inscription. The, the prophet said in the beginning, the law was written on stone. It was written on rock. But, but now you bear the, the writing of God on your, on your heart. Now it's a part of you. It's a part of you because you don't see the law as something outside of you. You have Jesus Christ. You have the Holy Spirit. You have forgiveness from sins. All you have to do is read off of your own sinful, redeemed nature to know what you should do, which is love the one who has redeemed you. And love your neighbor as yourself. There's two images in this story. There's the image of Caesar. Is there another image? There is another image. There is the image of God. There's a blasphemous image of God on the Roman coin. And there is a true image of God that all of us bear. There is a, the truest image of God, Jesus Christ. And our, our, our purpose, our, our, our walk, our, our work is not to exclude certain things from bearing the image of Jesus Christ but to live our lives so that in everything we do, like Zacchaeus, even in taxation, 
We act as Jesus Christ would act. Does that mean we have to give up taxation? No. It means you have to do it the right way. Collect what you're supposed to collect. This is the, uh, the culminating lecture of the course. And I've, as I've suggested to you, it, it brings us back to, to where we began. The, the beginning questions we asked were, uh, does knowing Jesus Christ have anything to do with knowing things of the world? Does knowing Jesus Christ have anything to do with the law? And in those lectures, we answered uh, affirmatively and absolutely. The, the scriptures teach us absolutely that all things that were made are connected to Jesus Christ. All things were made through him. All things subsist in him. They remain in him. And all things exist uh, towards him for his purposes. There, there is nothing which is unrelated to Jesus Christ. And we finish here with a challenge to it, a challenge that's raised, just as, as Satan quoted the Bible, a challenge that's raised from the words of Scripture. There are things committed to, G, uh, to uh, Caesar. Okay. There's respect due to man. There's honor due to parents. There's property that belongs to people. Uh, these things are true. Give them to them. But the, the weighty question of your life is, we as Christians only show respect to the authorities of the world, to Caesar, because they're the servants of our God. We, we, we honor them, we respect them, we obey them, but we obey them, as Peter says, for the sake of the Lord. It's the same way in all of our human relationships. We, we honor and respect our parents in the Lord. We obey even a, a rough and tough master because we want to serve the Lord. We, we do all these things for the sake of the Lord. There's no opposition God has appointed the rulers of the world. That was most of what we did in the middle part of this course is review scripture after scripture that says the structure of law, the structure of judging, the structure of every aspect of legal administration is stamped with the love and the concern and the will of God. So that if you go out to obey God, it is, it is perfectly right. It's important that you involve yourself in the right administration of these structures. Uh, that's the end of, of the course. This course uh, is, is to say that, that as we begun by, by affirming that Jesus Christ is Lord of all and King of all, and that this is true of, of human institutions, magistrates, rulers, laws, taxes, everything, um, it's true of everything. This is our gospel. This is the, the good news that we have that the, the personal salvation that we have in, in Jesus Christ through forgiveness of sins and knowing him is not local, it's not unconnected, but it's, it's the way that we go out into the world and love other people. It doesn't disconnect us from the world. It doesn't require us to retreat from the world. It requires us to go to where the sick are. It requires us to bring repentance, even to tax collectors, even people who have violated their relationship to Caesar. We want to save those people too from that sin. This is all good news. This is all part of the gospel. The gospel is, is your salvation in Jesus Christ. The gospel is the transformation of the world through Jesus Christ. The gospel is the world has not been abandoned. Jesus Christ and the Father love the world so much that Jesus Christ came to die for the world. It's good. It's great. Be renewed in your faith. Be strong in your faith. Wrestle with the doubts you have. Continue always to seek after Jesus and trust in Him. What we do in the law is very important. But the, the greatest thing of importance that we do is to know and trust and enjoy and love our Savior Jesus Christ. Everything else that we do is a... It's a, an exultance. It's an overflow. It's a, a result. It's, it's the flowing of living waters out of us. So rejoice in the Lord. Trust in Him. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Now, if, if Caesar, uh, as we, we see in the final readings here, if he tells you to do something like dishonor God, of course, you don't have to, to follow what he's, what he's saying. 
but whether you're following a teacher or a parent or a ruler or a Caesar, whoever it is, do it in the Lord. Do it for the Lord. Give to the Lord what is his due. That's the part that is never quoted by itself. I've heard people say, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and that's it. But you never hear people quote, give to the Lord what is the Lord's. Well, I'm happy to quote them both. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. This is a Christian law school. This is great. I, I, we, owe, we owe certain things to Caesar. We owe obedience and respect and honor and tax. But we owe it because we are the coin stamped with God's image. We owe ourselves completely to God. We owe all that we do completely to God. Not as the payment of a tax, but because returning to God is returning to who we are. Returning to God is returning all that we want. Returning to God means the forgiveness of sins. It means entry into eternal life. It means justice and righteousness and truth. Give to God what is God's. Amen.